Um, you will notice today in the uh, bulletin, it says prayer and scripture, and that's the way I've been asked to do it today, so don't think I'm going off here on my own thing. So, so if you'll join me, we're going to start with prayer, and then after we'll read the scripture. Let us pray. O oh Lord, you are all I have, and you give me all I need. My future is in your hands. And Lord, as we look out from these times of uncertainty, we know that you have the perfect plan for us, a plan to prosper and not to harm us, to give us hope and a future. And Lord, we are trusting in who you are. You are creator, provider, healer. You are unchangeable, wise, kind, merciful, gracious. You are infinite and powerful, yet personal. You are faithful, just, loving, holy, holy, holy. And you are glorious throughout the universe as you sit in glory on your throne. It is in these characteristics of you, Lord, that I will trust in you. And in that trust, we will look to the author and perfecter of our faith and find the peace and contentment that only he can provide. We thank you now for what you are doing. Those that we fret about, that you are healing them physically, emotionally, and spiritually. That you will protect those who are protecting us. And that you will continue your work in each one of us to be the people you created us to be. When we start to be anxious, Please turn our eyes to Jesus and remind us to pray just as he taught us to pray. As he said, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So today's reading is from the book of Malachi. It's the last book of the Old Testament, right before the Gospel of Matthew. You'll find it in your pew Bibles. Oh, where did I write that? Sorry. Um, on pages uh, 1488 and 1489. We're reading Malachi 2, verses 1 through 9. And now this admonition to you is for you, O priest. If you do not listen, and if you do not set your heart to honor my name, says the Lord Almighty, I will send a curse upon you, and I will curse your blessings. Yes, I have already cursed them, because you have not set your heart to honor me. Because of you, I will rebuke your descendants. I will spread on your faces the offal from your festival sacrifices, and you will be carried off with it. And you will know that I have sent you this admonition so that my covenant with Levi may continue, says the Lord Almighty. My covenant, my covenant was with him, a covenant, a covenant of life and peace, and I give them to, and I gave them to him. This called for reverence, and he revered me and stood in awe of my name. True instruction was in his mouth, and nothing false was found on his lips. He walked with me in peace and uprightness and turned many from sin. For the lips of a priest ought to preserve knowledge, 
and from his mouth men should seek instruction, because he is the messenger of the Lord Almighty. But you have turned from the way, and by your teachings have caused many to stumble. You have violated the covenant with Levi, says the Lord Almighty. So I have caused you to be despised and humiliated before all the people, because you have not followed my ways, but have shown partiality in matters of the law. Thanks be to God. We've been studying the book of Malachi, and I wanted to read that passage right before I got up, so we're going to think about it. You know, what I like about the Bible is that it's real, and it can be earthy at times. And this is one of those times when, when, when the Lord says he's going to spread awful on the faces of the priests. That's kind of brutal. Um, and yet there's a reason for all of this. You see, these guys were engaged in what you might call mindless worship. And like we talked about last week, they were doing two things. They were questioning the love of God and they were not honoring him in worship. Remember, the, the word says uh, you honor a father, you, the, the uh, sons honor their father, and then um, uh, servants honor their masters, but you're not honoring me. So he's, he's talking in chapter 1 about the people. Uh, they were engaged in this kind of a self-oriented worship. Um, they didn't appreciate his love. Now, we can sit here and we can say, well, you know, you ought to appreciate God's love. You know, that, that, of course you should. And that's right. That's exactly right. But sometimes our lives are not that easy. And that's easier said than done because we're just people. And what was going on there is that in reality, their lives were not easy. You know, they had been uh, really a whole generation had been banished or captured and gone to Babylon. And then really a new generation uh, was led back to Jerusalem. So for 80 years, Jerusalem was just filled with the people that, that the uh, Babylonians considered it really, they weren't really worth taking. So, so they were there. And now, so imagine after 80 years, here are these folks coming back from Babylon. And here's a, uh, 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 a city of their forefathers that had been laying in fallow or ruin for, for 80 years. And so they were coming back to that. And they were, they had rebuilt the temple. They had, uh, rebuilt the wall. They had reestablished their, their religious, uh, and worship, ceremonial law, that kind of stuff. But they're still having a hard time. There's a lot of work left to do. And on top of that, they were experiencing drought. They were experiencing plagues. They were having economic difficulties, economic hardship. And they were looking around at the struggles and they were saying, you know, Trust your promises, Lord, and this is what I get. And the truth of the matter is, we can look at them and go, you shouldn't be that way. But we all can get that way, can't we? There's always times like this that we have where we're faced with situation. One time or another where there's trials that test and try our faith. And I don't know about you, but we can become bitter and we can become disillusioned with God because we're just people. And we begin to question him, don't we? And it's difficult sometimes when we're called to walk by faith, when we want to walk by sight. So the situation that was going on in Malachi's day, we experienced, maybe not in exactly the same extent, but we experienced trials. We experienced periods in our lives when where we are called to walk by faith because there's no other way. But we like it when we get to see some of the Lord's blessing. But what had happened was, is that the, 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 to the toll of their struggles had caused them to no longer fear God. To no longer fear the Lord of hosts. That wasn't an excuse, that's just how it was. They no longer feared the commander in chief of the heavenly armies. And it seemed like when it came to worship and in their lifestyle, because worship is more than just coming to church on Sunday. Worship really is a lifestyle of living by faith in God. But it seemed like they were more interested either in profit or in their self-interest. 
in their survival, more interested in that than they were in living by faith in their God. And so what we see them doing is that they were keeping the best for themselves. They were saying, you know, I'm going to keep this because I need some good food for my family. Or I need this, keep this animal that's, that's, that, that's the best animal of my flock so that I can sell them for the greatest profit. And then they were just gathering up their leftovers and their, uh, you know, the, 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 uh, the blind animals and the lame animals and maybe the run of the litter. And they're gathering them up and throwing them together and they were uh, offering them to God. You can understand maybe why they did that, but it doesn't make it right. And the Lord is telling them that. He's holding their feet to the fire. He didn't say, oh, I'm so sorry that you have it so bad. You know, I can sympathize with your selfish worship, and I'm going to let it go this time. He already told them that he loved them and that they are privileged people because he has set his affection upon them, but he didn't let them get away with this. He said, cursed be the cheat who has a male in his flock and bows it, a good one, and yet sacrifices to the Lord what is blemished. They're not going to be blessed by having the best and not offering it to God in worship. And it wasn't enough that their difficult situation was causing them to struggle in keeping their eyes on the Lord. And what we're going to see today is that while the, 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 the Jewish people in that day had no excuse for the way that they were worshiping. They were responsible. But there was an important contributing factor. And it was this. The priests were in the same boat. They were doing the same things. They were the ones who were supposed to lead them. In the proper worship. So that they would be blessed. So that they would uphold their end of the, the covenant agreement. That God had signed with them. So they would be his people. <clears throat> and the priests were supposed to lead them in that. But they were right there with them. And we have expectations of leaders, don't we? There's a certain way a leader should be. We expect certain things out of, out of a president or out of a governor or out of a, a coach or, or, or a pastor. We expect a certain level of integrity, don't we? A certain level of honesty, uh, that their walk matches their talk, that they're worth being followed. And if a leader doesn't act the way that a leader should, then eventually the people won't follow. And, and, and they will, uh, not hold them to the status that they should be held because they don't deserve it in terms of integrity. And that was the problem with the priest in Malachi's day. They were lacking in integrity. Their walk didn't match their talk. They weren't doing what they were supposed to do. And they were living a mediocre, faithless life as priests. And consequently, what was happening is they were leading the way into worship that was cursed. They weren't honoring the God who loves them. And it was showing up in the lives of the people for whom they were responsible. The people were cheating God by keeping the best for themselves. They were giving the Lord those blemished animals. And the priests were cheating the people by accepting those sacrifices. See, everyone was looking out for themselves. Everyone was looking out for their best interest. The priest had to feed their family as well. And they might have been afraid that, well, if, if we don't accept this, they're not giving us the best, so we're not going to get anything. Well, let me give a little bit of an explanation about a role, the role of the priest. And they were, had a very high responsibility. One of the things that they were responsible for is that they were in charge of the whole sacrificial system. And this, think about, think about just the grittiness of what God is trying to, to, to establish in this whole sacrificial thing. It was set up to remind them of the seriousness of the covenant that God had made with them. Where he had said, I'm going to be your God. I've set my favor upon you. You're going to be my people. And I'm going to dwell in your midst. And God was there keeping his promises, but the people weren't acting like his people. And you see, those sacrifices were there to remind the people that they were set apart. And the priests were even set apart from them. They were distinct, set apart to the Lord. They were holy. That's why they needed an, uh, that's why God called them to give the most spotless animal that they could. And it was a reminder that following and honor God, that that was serious, life altering stuff. And the priests were there to make sure that it was followed.
So they were, set, they were in charge of all that. Next thing a priest does, another thing is that he intercedes for his people. He stands in the gap between God and people. And that's seen in the sacrificial system. He's the representative of God to each person. And he's the representative of each person to God. Then finally, it was their responsibility to teach and instruct the people uh, uh, in the lifestyle that they were supposed to live. And they're supposed to do it in a way that, that God was honored by their service and by their worship. So here's what, what they were doing. Now, well, you look down the quarters of time from his day. This entire system that God had set up to remind them of the seriousness of the promise that he had made with the people. And then God not only loved them, but he was worthy of being feared. And it was to point, the sacrifices over and over, was to point to the time of Jesus Christ, who is the great high priest, it was point to the one who is standing in the gap for us. The one who is interceding on our behalf. Praying on our behalf. To God the Father. You see, this whole system was pointing towards the full and final sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Now imagine that. It was pointing to the time when God became man. Jesus, the Son of God. And God the Father gave His Son. In the full and final sacrifice. That's what it's pointing to. But the people didn't see it. And the priests were failing. They're being bad priests. Instead of honoring God and instilling a sense of God's value and His greatness. Of His immense worth and His glory. They were right in there with them. Corrupting the very function of God honoring worship. No wonder God wasn't too pleased with them. Now. You might be saying those priests, I'll tell you what. But what does this passage have to do with me? I mean, I'm not a priest. This applies to you, Pastor Randy. You're the closest thing that we have to a priest. Don't worry, it definitely applies to me. But you're not off the, off the hook. because, And here's why. In Christ, we are all priests. Let me explain. You know, Jesus is our great high priest. Jesus entered the holy place. You know, when he died, that veil was, turned, was torn. The veil that, that only the high priest could pass, well, that veil was torn. And we now have access because of the blood of Christ. And that blood um, assures us of a once and all, uh, for all, eternal uh, redemption. Priests came and go, came and went. They lived and they died. But Jesus died and then he lived. And because Jesus died, all who believe in him live as well. His life is indestructible. Jesus is the full and final sacrifice, the teleos, the end, the fulfillment of the entire ceremonial law that was pointing to him the whole time. So that means this, the Old Testament priesthood is replaced once and for all by the priestly ministry of Jesus Christ. He is our great high priest. Ah, but then you look at 1 Peter and several other places. In 1 Peter chapter 2, Peter calls the whole church a holy priesthood. That means all believers, the universal church is set apart. And we're considered priests. We're considered representatives of the Lord. And then later he said this, you're a chosen race. You're a royal priesthood, a holy nation, people for his own possession. He's quoting a passage in the Old Testament and he's applying it to us. His own possession that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Revelation chapter 1, John says that the whole church has been called to be a kingdom of priests to God and His Father. So you see, we're not off the hook. <laughs> and it would be a good thing for all, to, all of us to listen to Malachi because the church is now the priesthood of God. And it's doubly important for every pastor to listen to Malachi because he's the spiritual leader of the congregation. 
Now today we're going to look at how to be a bad priest. Next week we're going to look at how to be a better priest, a good priest. And so there's two ways. And if you look at verses 8 and 9, there's two ways that stand out on how to be a bad, what they were doing. In verse 8 he says this to the priest, but you have turned from the way. The priest had committed more moral failure to honor God. You know, verse 2 says they don't listen to the word, they don't honor the Lord, and they don't take his word to heart. They fail to honor God. You know, when a, when a soldier gets his marching orders when they're about to go into battle, they don't sit back and say, well, hmm, let me think about that for a minute. I've thought about it, and I, I, just, I, just, I just don't think so. I, mean, I think I've got to look out for myself. <laughs> or when a, when a, a platoon is briefed for battle, every member of the platoon listens to their marching orders, not just to hear it and understand it, but to act on it with the intent to obey. And the priest, and consequently the people, were not listening with the intent to obey, and it was showing up in their sacrifices. Just turn from the way. And then earlier it says, they don't take his word to heart in verse 2. You see, the, the priest should have insisted that the people offer uh, um, uh, God honor and glory, not garbage. You know what they were doing? The, they were, the people were trifling with the Lord of hosts and the priest in that day should have known better. And for whatever reason, they're accepting those lesser sacrifices. Maybe they wanted to be people pleasers. Maybe they thought this is the best that we could do. But instead of walking in the fear and the love of God and encouraging the people to do the same, they were actually leading the people away from God by their instruction and in their conduct. And you can imagine if priests or if pastors don't take their relationship with God seriously, then no one else will. So they were failing in their moral duty both to God and to the people as well. Now think about this. Think about the consequences of this. Think about the consequences in our day of moral failure of a pastor, of a Christian leader. You know, we've all heard this, the tragedy. We've all heard tales when a, when a Christian leader is caught up in some kind of a scandal, you know, a moral scandal, and it sheds a bad light on our faith, doesn't it? We think hypocrite. It's tragic. You know, people inside the church are hurt. People outside to say this Christian stuff. And they bring dishonor on the name of Jesus Christ. And the result of the moral failure of the priest is that God says he will curse their blessing. Moral failure. It's interesting that the priests were to take a portion of the sacrifice for their own needs. That's the way it worked. They took a portion so that they would have food for themselves and for their family. And then he says, I will curse your blessings. Imagine what actually is happening. They are, they are receiving, they're allowing the people to sacrifice the worst animals. Well, that, that one's going to spoil. That meat's going to spoil. I'll give it to them. And so that means the priest, the blessing of receiving unblemished animals and taking a portion of that for themselves they were able to feast on unblemished animals but now they were just feasting on diseased animals and blind animals and unhealthy animals they weren't getting blessed by their poor sacrifices but what actually was happening is that their reputation and their honor was disintegrating God says God compares it to wiping their faces with awful O-F-F-A-L. What is that? That's all the stuff that's left over. The, the part that wasn't burned. The part that wasn't sacrificed. It was all collected. You know, it was just the gook that was left. Including manure or whatever you want to, however you want to say it. You know, that's the picture. It says you, you, by your actions, it's like rubbing that all over your face. That's brutal. But it's real. And the curse, it said, was passed to their offspring. That was the priesthood that was to point to the great high priest, Jesus Christ. So that's the first thing, moral failure. And the second thing might even be worse. In verse 9, they talk about lack of instruction. They weren't instructing the people. As As troubling as moral failure is, the fact that they were not teaching the people could have worse effects 
than moral failure. And here's why. When a pastor or church leader fails morally, what happens? Well, eventually they usually get shamed and removed. And people around them, you know, it just catches them by such surprise. They put so much trust in that person. And now they violated their trust. And they've shown themselves to be hypocrites or whatever the case might be. And they're removed. And they're sent away. And eventually the people get over it. They're hurt. But when a pastor teaches wrong stuff, wrong doctrine, bad instruction, a lot of times they can stay in the church and it becomes more and more widespread. You know, just look at the impact on the church by those who teach, for instance, that the Bible is not really the word of God. Think how bad theology fits right into our culture. You know, our culture says it doesn't really matter what you believe as long as you believe it. Did you catch that? Truth already is becoming in our society a matter of what you believe. You know, um, you know, we say, we believe in Jesus Christ. I'm not even sure if that works anymore. I'm not even sure if I should say, I believe in Jesus Christ. Because society would say, well, that's good. It's good to have something to hold on to. I believe in, um, I believe in Mother Earth, you know, and I have a right to that belief. So they hold that belief equal with believing in Jesus Christ or something like that. They expect us to have the same respect for their belief that we have for our belief. It's a mutual respect because what you believe becomes truth. And then I've got to say, wait a minute, all beliefs are not equal. And so maybe what Christians need now is more of a distinction. You know, Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. He doesn't say I'm a way. I am a truth. I am a way to a life. I mean, God has given us one way. And that's Jesus Christ. He says that. And if we believe that, if we believe that he actually said that, that kind of sets things up in such a way that, that either you believe that as truth, That Jesus is true or he's not true. And you don't have to believe that Jesus is true to make him true. He's true whether we believe it or not. All beliefs are not equal. He's the way and it's not a matter of people believing that makes him that. Jesus is God not because everybody in the church believes he's God. But he's God, and so what we believe in is the truth. So, as we wind this up, you know, here it is. As the royal priesthood of God, pastors and people in the church, we need to know how to defend our faith. We need to know how to say, well, okay, if this is really true, what is unique about this truth as opposed to all the other truths? If not, And what we have in Christ is just going to become one of many equal options on the way to live. And pastors need to instruct the people and they need to practice their faith so that they believe, so people will believe it really is what it is. So here's the thing. What can we gain from this? What are some takeaways? Well, first realize that we're all priests. You know, now we might be priests in the, in the, in the offering of sacrificial stuff because Jesus has already done that. But people see us, the outside world looks in and sees us. And they see the validity of believing in Jesus Christ by the way we love people, by the way we seek to honor the Lord, by the way we get excited about the things that excite Him. Another thing is this, I want to thank you how many times you pray for me. Um, You know, we're all responsible because we're part of the holy priesthood. But but the Bible says that pastors and teachers will incur a stricter judgment if they fail in their tasks. So thank you for praying for me and let's pray for each other. I think another takeaway is to examine ourselves in the light of the word of God. Are we struggling? Are we uh, doubting God's goodness? Or are we open to hearing from God and acting upon it as we need to? Then we need to seek to see the world more and more through the lens of the truth of God. Then finally, we need to change where we need to change. It's called repentance. 
We live with the gospel every day. We want to learn how to enjoy more what it means to trust and obey. And we need to count it all joy when we encounter various trials. Now next we're going to look at a good priest. It says, for the lips of a priest should guard knowledge. And a priest should seek instruction from his mouth. People should seek instruction from his mouth. For he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. We are a royal priesthood. God is the Lord of hosts. Therefore, present your bodies as living sacrifices. For that is your acceptable worship to God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, um, yeah, we acknowledge that a lot of times we act like those people. Uh, and we acknowledge that we need you to help us to be any different. And we're so grateful for your grace and mercy in our lives that we can, by believing in Jesus Christ, we are guaranteed to have a relationship with you, even as imperfect as we are. Father, help us to live in such a way where we can please you and where we can gain enjoyment and satisfaction. Help us in the midst of the difficulties that we go through, Lord. We need you. And we pray these things in your son's name. Amen.